Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine. How's it going? You have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what, what, what seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the, in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? He ate two feet before we nursed. Delicious, Liberty. It's a shit I'm shaking like a dog. Shit peach seeds. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. Top men. And just like that, we are into the second hour. Welcome aboard. It's the Barbecue Central Show. We talk about... Really neat barbecue and grilling stuff right here on the show for two hours every Tuesday night. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Remember, folks, this is not a podcast. Andrew, you are not the host. That's right. This is not a podcast. This is a live show. It's happening right now from Tuesday, every Tuesday, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you hit my website, if you go to Facebook, if you go to YouTube, if you go to TuneIn, you can get all the live feeds right here. The show is happening live. That's why we say we do it live. We'll do it live. That's right. We'll do it live. Do it live. I I write it. I write it and we'll do it live. We do it live. Every Tuesday. If you listen to the show on Wednesday or Thursday, you're listening to a recording of the live show or what I would term technically a podcast. Although it's not pre-recorded stuff. It's not edited. It's none of that. It's a real live show that I'm recording. That seems to be the hot term now for a recorded show is podcast because you can subscribe to it through a lot of the podcast feeds and all that crap. So, hey. Subscribe to it if you miss it on the first hour. Go to iTunes, go to Google Play, go to whatever podcast catcher you like. And certainly you will be able to subscribe to this show so you'd never miss an interview like a great first-time guest, Nick Solaris, in the first hour. Can't believe you missed that. What was going on in your world that was better than listening to the first interview I've ever done with Nick Solaris? I can't think of one thing that any of you have going on right now that would be better than listening to that interview. Getting background on Nick, hearing about how he built up from living in England, moving to New York in at 16? That's young. And then going starting Beef Aficionado, the blog, as he said, the golden years of blogging. Going to Serious Eats. We love Kenji Lopez-Alt here on this show. He's been a guest before. Very fun. Then going to Eater and now getting ready for another new YouTube show. So very much looking forward to that. So going to try and get Nick on the show much sooner than later so we can actually dive into some of the topics that I was looking to have him on. But thought it was at least somewhat important that if you don't know who he is, Get a little background, build a little rapport with the centralites. So when he comes back on, we have that well-rounded knowledge base on kind of where he started and where his point of view is coming from, how he was honed and refined from a culinary sense. So that was Nick. And then Mike McLeod talked about the potential new look of the World Food Championships final table that could be happening as early as the end of November or some holiday. So in a couple weeks, Mike will be back on the show once things are locked up, and we'll learn exactly what will happen. Maybe there won't be too much of a difference at the end. Maybe there'll be a whole big difference. But he said, and as I say, I said in the top of the show, 2018 rapidly coming to a close. We are right at the nail end of the month of July. August starts next week. Month eight. World Food Championships is three months after that. Less than that, I would imagine. So they got to have things locked down in order to get the World Food Championships to come off the way they have always hoped it would come off. We'll see what happens with that. 
All right, I had briefly mentioned that you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, and for the last number of weeks, you have heard the trials and tribulations of your show host saying, at the end of May, Apple sent me a note, email that said, hey, owner of the Barbecue Central show, guess what? We're ripping your show off the network. You're done. Get that big stuff out of here. Why? What did I do? Nothing has changed. I've done the same thing after every show, aside from cutting up hour one and hour two this year. I've done the same thing for 11 years. Same podcast feed, same repetition, all that crap. And at the end of May, they told me, your show isn't working. We're taking it off iTunes. You can't find it in the store anymore. Now, if you had already subscribed to the show as I was pushing updates with those podcasts from the live show on Tuesday, no big deal. You didn't really notice anything. But I want to continue to grow the show. And iTunes is a huge platform for podcasts. So that's typically where people want to go. And they go in to search BBQ. My show wasn't showing up. As an option to subscribe to when barbecue podcasts were being searched. I can't have that. I didn't know it was going to take two months to fix. However, the iTunes issue firmly resolved. So once again, and I say this with peace and love. If you were already subbed to the show prior to the last six weeks, you haven't noticed any issues. The show updated as usual. However, the bigger issue was that iTunes yanked me off the menu for people to find and subscribe to. So we're finally able to get back approved last Wednesday. And now the show is findable when you search so you can sub up again. Here's the downside. Here's the request from me to you. When we made the new listing, while we didn't lose any subscribers, we lost all reviews and ratings. Uh Now, for like six or seven of those, I'm not necessarily sad to see those get wiped out. And I had no idea. I didn't want any ratings or reviews to get wiped out. They were dating back to like 2009 for crying out loud. So if I may ask... To inconvenience you, especially if you use iTunes. Now, if you use Google Play Music or Stitcher or TuneIn or iHeart or all the other podcast platforms that had no issue with me other than iTunes, you can still rate and review the show in those as well. I would like that. But if you use iTunes, and the majority of you do, please find the show in iTunes or go through iTunes on the computer and rate and review the show. I'm not asking for a five-star rating. I'm not saying I'm going to offer free rub. Uh If you give me a five-star rating, screenshot it and send it to me. I'm not saying that. I am saying when I have reviews and ratings, it makes the show even more visible to everybody just searching around the general iTunes store in the podcast section. So please, oh, please... Do me a favor, and I don't ask for anything from you guys except support the show sponsors, but other than that, I'm not asking for anything. Please rate and review the show however you see fit. Be honest. Don't be like Peanut in the basement and say, out of a 120-minute show, it's 118 minutes of commercials. You know it's not. You know it's not. Don't be like Sammy the DJ in Tennessee and say he plays way too many sound effects. It's so morning zoo. F you. You don't like my sound effects? Beat it. Don't sub up. You're banned from subbing to my show. I have that network capability. I know if you don't like my sound effects and I already have you banned from subscribing to the show. How about that? So don't even try. Otherwise, rate and review me. I would love it. I would love to. Got an email from a listener. Dear Greg, I was just listening to the show where someone called you on the phone and said they were going to put you in the Barbecue Wizard Hall of Fame. I listened to that part six times and I'm trying to figure out if that was a planned bit 
or if you were able to roll with that caller just to see where they would go during that call. My guess is that you were letting the caller work and you were feeding off of him, but I could be wrong. Can you shed some light on that? Also, when's the next time you're going to have Ted Reader back on the show? I used to love his appearances, and I've noticed he's not been on recently. Anyway, enjoy the show, Rick in Denver. Rick, thanks for writing it. Rick, do you know Dennis Busso? He's in Denver. Dennis is a barbecue guy. Look each other up. Rick was getting into the, almost getting into the Barbecue Hall of Fame, the Barbecue Wizard Hall of Fame, a bit or not. I don't know what you're asking me. Do you think that that was like a conceived thing? That was written out? Why would you think that? If that's what you think, maybe that's what it was. If you're going with your gut, saying that you think I was rolling with somebody trying to mess with me, I would say, believe that. I can tell you this. That was a real call. Tell you that. Uh, Ted Reader will be back on the show sooner than later, believe it or not. Love, Teddy. Embedded correspondence segment coming up out of the break. I want to talk to you quickly about Big Papa Smokers, the number one online shop for all things barbecue. Their curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies will get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at Big Papa Smokers has been Pitmaster approved by Sterling Big Papa Ball himself. From the award-winning rubs and sauces to American-made grills and smokers, Big Papa Smokers has everything you need to be a better outdoor cook. They're known for the championship rubs and seasonings. I use them all the time. Popular flavors like Sweet Money, Cattle Prod, Cash Cow, all proven winners on the competition circuit and in the backyard. Big Papa Smokers offers 13 perfectly balanced flavors that will transform ordinary meals into extraordinary Whether you're cooking to impress the judges or grilling for your family, Big Papa Smokers' award-winning rubs and seasonings don't disappoint. Don't forget, they've combined forces with fellow rub companies Simply Marvelous to form that West Coast offense that all the teams are using out there and doing very well with. They also own Granny's Barbecue Sauce. If you're looking for a new go-to barbecue sauce that will please everyone, Granny's traditional yet powerful flavors remind us why we fell in love with barbecue in the first place. Find Granny's Barbecue Sauce and other top-rated barbecue sauces. At BigPapaSmokers.com, and aside from their premium selection of rubs and sauces, they offer a variety of the very best pellet charcoal and wood cookers available today. If you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, check out the MAC 2-Star General Pellet Grill. Big Papa Smokers is the exclusive MAC dealer and even offers special packages. Not a fan of pellet smokers? Take a look at the Old Hickory Ace BP. It's the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. And if you're a backyard grilling enthusiast like me looking for a durable and versatile grill that will last forever, the M Grill is just what you need. Built like tanks, seen them in person at the NBBQA. Not sure what kind of grill you need? You really can't go wrong with any of the items featured at BigPapaSmokers.com. They have something for every kind of backyard cook and budget. Check out their website today and shop the full selection. It's clear that Big Papa's is the place to go for all things barbecue. Every product featured on their website has been hand-selected to help you barbecue better. Boost your barbecue skills with the help of Big Popper Smokers, the number one online barbecue store. You can call them toll-free at 877-828-0727 or shop their website at BigPapaSmokers.com. That's B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A Smokers.com. The Embedded Correspondence segment. As we return, stick around. We'll be right back. Show giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead, the author of a barbecue Bible, bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Hey, Smoking with Smithfield committed cooks. Make sure you head over to smokingwithsmithfield.com and report your first place wins. To claim all your prizes. Have you registered to compete in the American Royal Pork Loin Ancillary? Smithfield just increased the prize purse to $6,000. Make sure you sign up at the American Royal website today. And don't forget to sign up 
for the Smithfield Classic, which will be in Richmond, Virginia on September 29th. To sign up, reach out to Jesse at Big Papa Smokers. That's Jesse, J-E-S-S-I-E, at BigPapaSmokers.com. All right, it's that time of the month. Not that time of the month, you weirdos. It is that time of the month for the Embedded Correspondence Segment. That's right. And joining me this evening is Embedded Correspondent Steve Ray from Tennessee. We also have David Huff from Oklahoma. And we may or may not have Doug Shiding from Texas. Doug has dropped off the mark here. But, uh, guys, I'm going to dump you off here real quick and try and reconnect with everybody. Because, you know, for, uh, for, for the amount of issues that Steve Ray was having as we were sound checking yesterday, he looks loud and proud here now. So, like, turnabout is fair play. Everybody bagging on Steve yesterday, but look how good he looks. Jesus, <laughs> it is so nice. Uh, Doug, are you everything, there? At least uh, by but voice. The shirt, Steve. Come on. <laughs> Doug, hey, I got that. I got that for the uh, for the uh, big cook off here last week in Chattanooga. You won that? No, oh, and win it. I am seated. Oh, okay. So that that's I your. Not, I, I never win, so I decided to start yeah. hosting. That's your look, is what you're saying. My look. Yeah, it's a showpiece. All right, uh, so we got the embedded correspondence here. Uh, Steve, Doug, and David. Doug, are you there or no? Well, I'm going to take that as a big fat no. Oh, Steve, how we love to laugh to ourselves, don't we? Yeah, yeah, I love it. All right, uh, guys, we're going to start. So is if, if you're a fan of the show and you listen, of course, to the embedded correspondence segment, you know that at the... We talked a lot about steak last week. We talked a lot about temperature. We talked a lot about what I am calling the uh, purposeful miss or the, the purposeful undercooking of steak across America. And I said, hey, uh, not only did I task Daniel Vaughn with it the week before, but the following week you guys were on. And I said, go over the next month, go to some kind of steakhouse. It doesn't have to be prime. If you want to do prime, if you want to do a chain. Whatever, without doing it at home, but go somewhere and bring a thermopen, which we all know potentially very dangerous because people might look at you like you're weird and chefs might get offended. And as uh, Steve pointed out uh, last month, they might think you're like a health inspector or something along these lines and chase you out the out the place. But you guys were up for the task and said, we will do this and we will report back so we can see. Just from a, a very small swath of this great land of ours, if we're having purposeful undercooking of meat. So let's go right to Oklahoma embedded correspondent, David Huff. I have your pictures. If you want to give us a little talk up on what your experience was, where you went, what you ordered, I'll go ahead and make sure that I'm uh, flashing pictures as you call them out. Okay. So bear with me, Greg. I'm only seeing the video over on my PC on the screen. I only see your picture, so I can't quite see what pictures you're showing. But um, so I went to Ruth Chris uh, last weekend in Tulsa, Oklahoma. All right. Um, I figured that steakhouse should know what they're doing for the money that they are charging you for a piece of meat on a white platter. And just happened to be celebrating my birthday, 42 years old at the casino. So it was well, a good time. Happy birthday. How about that? <laughs> Everybody, one much. and a two. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. To you. Thank okay. you very much. There you go. Move on. So um, I had four people at the table. We all ordered steaks. Um, we tested three of the four steaks because one of them cooked theirs too. <clears throat> well done. What? <laughs> and, um, I wasn't going to test theirs because that just is not right. That's just as bad as boiled hot dogs, right? right? David, uh, Steve and, and Steve and Doug are way too nice. I'm saying time for new friends. you got to be kidding. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh. Test it. I want to know what it was cooked to. Uh, wow. Well, I will ha- we'll have to go back maybe. But um, So what you're seeing there is actually 120 point. Well, first off, let me start over or let me jump back. I did ask the waiter. Do your chefs use thermometers or do they just go by, you know, feel or they know how long it should take 
And he said, absolutely, they use thermometers. Now, he didn't sound very convinced when he said it, but his answer was, they absolutely do. So as soon as the steaks come out, now they did say they serve their steaks. It's kind of a pride for them. They serve them on 500-degree plates. Yeah, Ruth and Chris not lying. calling The card. plates hit my forearm. They are scorching. Oh, wow. So um, the steak came out. I ordered mine to medium rare, um, and I actually asked him to cook it to about 125. And the first picture that you were showing there, Greg, um, was 120.4. So a little under on the delivery, especially since that plate probably helped with the carryover. I'm sure it kept cooking sure. from the time they put it in the window to the time it got to me. And that was a ribeye, probably about an inch thick or so. I think there's a picture of the ribeye a little bit later on. Is this it? Um, there's a little bit of a lag here. Is that the, is that the one that's got the shrimp on it? No, nope, that's the filet. All right. This is probably the one yeah. here. So you, you got it uh, turned yeah. up with a fork. Yeah, probably yep. so. Okay. So, and then um, the fillets were both ordered specifically to 135. Um, and they came out. Um, 129.8. You got it. Wow. Yep. Yep. Undercooked. And again, if they would have accounted for the carryover in those scorching hot plates, I'm sure it would have been much closer to 135. But at 129, with the carryover and the hot plates, they, I would say they grossly undershot it, trying to hit 135. Um, David, I don't want to point out very simple task commands, but you ordered your steak to medium rare, but I said do medium. What are you doing? Come on, so we can't get no an accurate. We can't get an accurate reading for test controls if you're just going to throw <laughs> away my commands. I mean, what are we doing here? We might as well pound our head against the wall. There was science behind it, Greg. Uh, listen, I had two girls that wanted to cook their steaks to medium. I wasn't going to pay $70 for a steak cooked to medium when I wanted it medium rare. So they were the guinea pigs, and I was the anomaly <laughs> I see, at I see. medium rare. We're just throwing all caution. Half the show, whatever. Okay, I see how it is. That's fine. So, I mean, in your estimation, you think that at least the fillets were, were grossly undercooked. And I would hazard to, I would hazard to say because uh, I don't know if Steve and Doug are overly familiar with Ruth's Chris, but like their calling card, like I remember when I was hearing their commercials ten and fifteen years ago, that uh, what the hell is that lady's name? Uh, Chris Evelyn Chris or whoever the founder lady is. That was like the thing she talked about in all the radio commercials was our steaks are served on five hundred degree plates, so your steak yeah. is hot from the first bite to the last bite. Now, back then, I had no idea that that was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. Is you're basically putting a, a little plate grill in front of you, so they're. I would imagine they're probably cooking their steaks well under because they are accounting for quite a while of carryover cooking. I mean, a 500 degree plate that stays hot for that long. It's almost like you go to steak on a stone and they put that rare piece of beef on that volcano stone and you just cook it by cutting it up and you know flipping it a little bit. So. I don't like the the volcano plate. I don't like that at all. Yeah, I, I agree. Not to mention, I mean, when you have a fairly small table with wine glasses and side dishes and, you know, the candles in the middle, there's not a lot of room. And you go touching that plate and it's hot enough to put a burn on you. That's no joke. Um, I will say, and this makes sense, the fillets were affected less by the carryover than the ribeye, mm. and I'm guessing that's just because of the width of the meat. I mean, those fillets were a good two two inches thick, where the ribeye was much closer to an inch, so um, the fillets definitely did not get much carryover at all, and that ribeye got a little bit, I think. All right, so uh, overall thought, are, are you a believer in purposeful undercooking of beef? <clears throat> Uh, based on those results, if you would think that that restaurant should exactly know what they're doing, account for everything that carry over. I mean, they're supposed to be professionals. They're getting a lot of money to put a piece of meat on a, on a plate. So I think it might have some truth to it. All right, let's go to the guy that first filed his report. Of course, uh, the longest running embedded correspondent of the Barbecue Central Show's history, Doug Scheiding, pitmaster of Rogue Cookery. You'll find him out on the barbecue trail with Traeger, also giving shop classes. So, uh, Doug, I have your pictures ready to go here, and tell us about your experience. 
Perfect. I would like to say one thing is when they tell you not to touch the, the platter because it's too hot, what do you normally do? I always touch it just to see how hot it is. I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm not a fan of the volcano plate either. But uh, OK, so I was in New York. Uh, I was really excited after after our uh, uh, talk last month. And so um, uh, about a week or so later, I was in New York and we went to the quality Italian steakhouse. Now, it. it it's just south of Central Park on 57th Street in New York, and uh, uh, we went there, and I just happened to have my thermometer with me because uh, I was doing a barbecue assignment, and so I ordered a tomahawk ribeye, and it was it was only fifty eight dollars, which which in the end is really not not bad. Was it dry and, age? And you can see the. Uh, yeah, it was it. Thirty yes, days. It was. It was dry aged. Yes, it was dry aged for like twenty eight, thirty, yep. 30 days allegedly. So, but um, <laughs> so I ordered it. The and I told the waiter I wanted to cook to exactly. Now I went to one forty because I thought that was the original assignment. You're so correct. I did go yeah. go go to one forty, and uh, he just looked at me and he said, "Yes, sir." And he wrote down one forty, and he went off, and came back. What thirty minutes later? And lo and minutes. behold, with the carryover, it was 142. I waited about another 30 seconds. Wow. And it, and it went to 144. So they did cook it to exactly 140, I'd, I'd say. And you can see it's still moderately pink on the inside. Yep. And, yep. you know, it was probably an inch and a half thick. So, you know, given it was a tomahawk and stuff. So it was actually one of the best steaks I've had in a long while because, truthfully, I don't order steaks out much because uh, I'm usually disappointed in the quality of the steak or how they've cooked it, et cetera. So I would say it, it was a resounding success. Now, last night, it's not exactly a steak, but I did order uh, center cut filet sliders and it came out and I asked for 140 again. And it came out at 145 and then 147 Whoa. after another th 30 seconds. So it was just a tad overcooked. And again, that was much thinner. That was a much thinner piece of meat because it was on a slider. But um, so my experience was, no, I didn't have the the undercooking issue that uh, that you said. So when you asked to have the steak go to a specific temperature, was there any trepidation from your server or like, you know, who are you? Our guys know the way, or were they just like, hey, we're super accommodating, we get it, this is a whole experience thing, and whatever you want, we're going to do. The guy in New York was just, just looked at me and saw that that's exactly what I meant. He wrote it down. Did, I didn't say medium rare, medium. I just didn't say anything. Now, last night when I ordered, uh, the lady said, because she asked me what temperature that I wanted the, the steak to. <laughs> and, I, and I said, 140. And she, she looked at me and she goes, no, 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 no. Do you want it medium rare, medium? And I said, no, you asked me what temperature, and I want it specifically at 140. And she goes, are you, you sure? Are you serious about that? And I said, yes, 140. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that threw her in for a loop. Did, uh, when I asked for that, did so. she say that they cook with thermometers at that place you were at yesterday? No, she acted like that, that she had already stepped in, in the pile of dung once. And so uh. she acted like that was a totally new concept. And then we also <laughs> ordered lamb lollipops and she asked what we wanted that cooked to. And I said, just have that cooked to the, uh, the chef's choice. And those came out at 134. Oh, so they were more. Uh, they were like a little more rare on the medium rare side of, of medium, yeah. I guess. Wow. How, yeah. So yeah, yeah. from a, I don't want to diverge here, but which one did you prefer the slider or the, the lamb lollipop? Actually, I preferred the uh, lamb lollipops because uh, the, it was a thicker piece of meat. And, you know, I just, you know, you get to gnaw on the bone a little bit. Who doesn't like to gnaw on the bone a little bit? So the people yeah. that you were at the New York steakhouse with, did they also order a temperature, or were they just the normal medium rare or, or whatever? Or what was the yeah. what was the the temperature that won the day? I guess what was mostly ordered. Oh, the, they actually uh, ordered uh, one ordered fish and w the other fish. one ordered pasta. <laughs> it was steakhouse and get fish. Yeah. It was an Italian steakhouse. What can I say? I'll but take it the was flounder. Pretty, it, it was pretty swank. It was hmm. pretty swank. It was a nice place. One of the nicest places you've been. 
Uh, not nicest places okay. I've been, but but the bottle of wine that we ordered was, you know, the third cheapest one that I ordered was ninety eight dollars. You know what? I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but before I understood how restaurants worked, I thought that bottle cost was the same as if I went to my local wine merchant. That was a thirty dollar <laughs> bottle of wine you were drinking that was ninety dollars. I mean, they they add triple yep. the cost, so. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. probably a thirty-five, thirty-eight dollar bottle of wine because, uh, yeah. But you order it, and in your mind, you're like, "Oh, it's a hundred dollar bottle of wine." Meanwhile, you're telling the server, "Like, go decant this for forty-five minutes. Make sure it does not under direct sunlight." Meanwhile, it's a thirty dollar bottle of wine, and you look, and they're like, "Look at this guy's decanting a thirty dollar bottle." Of wine. Yeah. It was no, it was Whitehall Lane. Whitehall Lane is a good, good uh, uh, proprietor in California. Yeah. All right. So uh, that is Doug Shining, the Texas embedded correspondent. Uh, once again, uh, just for review, because we got off on a couple of different rabbit holes. Yep. You you found yep. your request to be accurate, had no issues, no purposeful undercooking that you experienced. No, and in fact, uh, yeah, last night it was overcooked. Right. Okay. Uh, Steve Ray is the Tennessee embedded correspondent. Uh, Steve, go ahead and tell us where you went, and then when you're ready, just tell me to to roll the videos. Well, my my esteemed colleagues, one going to Ruth Chris, the other going to um, the Italian Steakhouse. I wanted to up the game, so I went to the uh, five star restaurant here in Ultwa, oh. Beef O'Brady Sports Bar. <laughs> wow, nice! <laughs> and soon to be overtaken by the Ultwa Chick Fil A, from what I understand. <laughs> exactly right, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Tawny, our waitress, Katane. Uh, came. Katane. <laughs> I hear you, Doug. She, she, she came out to the table and took the order, for, and I, uh, I ordered a steak, and the uh, panic looked on her face right away, like, "Oh my God, this guy's actually ordering a steak!" I, you know, I didn't know we had those things. I thought it was all chicken wings, <laughs> and uh, I ordered mine at a hundred and forty degrees or, or medium. And uh, roll, go ahead and roll the tape. All right. Start filming. All right, welcome back to Beef O'Brady's, the five-star sports bar here in Old Our waitress, Brittany, has arrived with the serve on Brittany. So that, and, I, and I want you to get real close on this. We're going to pin the sirloin. I can't see. What's it say? 142. 142. Wow. 142. That is the perfect, perfect medium, Brittany. 142 degrees. So, folks, there you have it. I hope that that, that dispels the myth that Greg Rempe and some of his followers have said that thank you, Brittany, very much. I thought it was Tawny. I thought it was Tawny too. Your chef Tawny took the order to a certain temperature into a certain degree of goneness. All right, uh, you get a little long in the tooth there, if I'm being honest, Steve. So, <laughs> no, not Steve. Yeah, but I, I so, can't wait to hear yours, Greg. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, really, yeah, it's going to be really short. So, Steve, you know, I mean, when uh, I go it, first, I never take a lot of time. That's right. So, in the end, like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what was your anticipation? I'm anxious to hear like what your expectation was. If you go to it, we have a couple beef O'Brady's around here. I've actually never been to one, but I haven't heard anything terribly great. I haven't heard anything terribly bad. So as somebody who is a, 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 a competitive barbecue cook, I mean, you're very handy with the grill when you're talking about high heat anyway. What is your expectation going into a facility like that to prepare something for you to a temperature? Well, they, um, you know, steak over there is a new thing. They they've just introduced it within the last six months. I that's the first one I've had, uh, and I, fellas, I'm gonna tell you, it was good. It, there was nothing wrong with it. it. wasn't very big. You know, that was like a sample of what I would yeah. order outside. But um, but it but it was good. But you know what? What I did when uh, this week I put out a little poll to my on my Facebook page, and I posted it to the um, American Culinary Federation page here, the local chapter, and I was soliciting soliciting uh, opinions about do restaurants uh, serve steaks uh, undercooked for a reason. Steve, and, um, Steve let me interrupt yeah. just for one second. Can we tease with that? Let me do a read, and then we'll come back and get your feedback from the question that you solicited to your local chapter. 
Absolutely. Do that. All right. Hold on one second. We'll uh, get right back with Steve results. We also have Doug and David aboard here talking about their steak field assignments. Let's say it that way. I'll talk to you quickly about Cook Shack. They manufacture smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of experience, whether you barbecue in the backyard on the competition circuit or in a five-star dining facility. Cook Shack has a unit that will do the job and with a full line of barbecue sauces, spices, pellets, wood chunks. It's the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, two blogs, smoke and grilling 101s, a video cooking classroom. Check out their website at cookshack.com or follow them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, or Google+. Get advice and share your passion for barbecue on their world-class barbecue forum. <laughs> they still have one of those. Cook Shack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion, Ed Fast, Eddie Morin. The FEC 100, PG 1000, always customer favorites. The PG 1000 can actually double as a smoker and a grill. Low and slow, hot and fast. <laughs> fast. The pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. Cook Shack Residential Electric Smokers, the number one smoker in the industry. High quality means high durability and versatility. Anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cook Shack. Passion and dedication drives Cook Shack's manufacturing, with quality always being the top priority. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800-423-0698. That's 800-423-0698. Or visit cookshack.com. Wow. Can't even tell you what's going on on my other screen. We'll be back with more Embedded Correspondence segment right here on the Barbecue Central Show. Stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. The National Barbecue News is dedicated to all things barbecue. Their goal, to introduce new people to the barbecue world while keeping the barbecue enthusiasts and professionals like my embedded correspondents informed on all current happenings in and around Barbecue Nation, whatever that is. They obtain this goal by offering timely new stories, new product reviews, barbecue event calendar, and unique recipes inside their printed products, website, social media pages, and email newsletters. Subscribe now by visiting barbecuenews.com. That's B-A-R-B-E-C-U-E News. Dot com. All right, guys, we're back at it. Uh, Steve was just teasing how he had submitted a question on his local, what was it, the local chef's chapter in a- Ul- Ul- ACF, Ul- American Culinary Federation. All right, so you, what was the question that you posted, and what were some of your interesting responses back? Do the restaurants or the staff that you, where you work, are they directed to undercook steaks on purpose in case they're set back, mm-hmm. they can be warmed up and not thrown away is this an and, edict uh, is what you're saying in other words what now? i said in other words is this an edict that is being passed down from your bosses yes exactly right, right. Okay. exactly right and the first response i got was from a uh a, a female server and i thought that was really a unique we never i never thought that we'd get you didn't, a, a you server didn't, to you didn't know this. females were servers at this point is that what you're saying i knew i knew that okay i knew that <laughs> We'll get to, we'll get to yours in a minute, okay? Yeah. And the, Tony uh, and Brit- Brittany, take your time. Yeah. And she said that um, when she would turn in the order, depending on who was doing the cooking in the kitchen, yeah. she would most of the time, if somebody ordered it medium, she would say medium rare. If somebody ordered it well done, she would say you know, like uh, medium well. It's because she she took the. Uh, uh, position that the steak is going to sit on the counter for a little bit. It's going to rise in temperature, and by the time she gets it to the customer, it will be at the perfect temperature. Mm. And I thought that you know the the server dictating to the cook, you know how to cook it, other than the customer. I thought that was just interesting. But another fellow who was a who was a chef a long time at Logan's, and he's a a listener and a watcher of your show, Greg. Oh, great. He, he, he answered a very interesting thing. He said one time he sent out six steaks to a patron mm-hmm. and they were all set back. 
And he said the complaint was they were ordered at medium and the complaint from the, the gentleman was these are still too rare to eat. Hmm. He was cutting them and looking at them. And guess what it was? And we just heard it last week yep. from Meathead. It was the fluorescent lights. Wow. He went out and turned up the lights in the dining room on the sixth steak to tell the customer the steak is perfect. It's the lights that make it look red. And he's right. When I was at Beef O'Brady's, when I cut into it, the steak looked really, really red, but it but it was cooked to 140 degrees, so I knew it wasn't. You know, it looked like it was like a 120 degree hmm. steak, David. But um, man, it, it was it was tasted good, and I just thought that was interesting that the light was tricking his patrons as well. And I had never heard that from until I heard from Meathead, and then this fellow said the same thing. I thought that was pretty interesting. Doug. Maybe that's why some people uh, carry the flashlights then, right? Hmm. Well, Doug, I, I believe you have you might have offered up the next field task, which is everybody hits another restaurant, bring thermopen <laughs> and a flashlight. And flashlight, flashlight to get the there picture. Yeah, because uh, the other thing he, that Meat had said last week that I didn't really, I mean, I knew about it, but I wasn't really thinking about it, is that people don't know temperatures. And how they correspond with what a rare steak temperature is, what a medium rare steak temperature is. And the struggles that I had been having over the last couple times of, of grilling where I, I took it too far. So I didn't know where my, t that's why after that one week I backed off and said, Hey, let's order at one thirty and a lot for some carryover cooking. So if it's within that one thirty five to one forty instead of doing one forty. Um, I had to like reteach myself that the temperature is really more of the, the main component here than how it looks. And people don't know what that is supposed to look like. So you have to go with, with temperature at that point. So I just thought I'd throw that in there and give uh, meatheads accolades as well, since Steve was doing it. But that was very important because I know I'm going to be pulling my steaks off probably another five or six degrees cooler than I did the last time. It's probably going to be at 126 or 127. So are we good to order at 135 then? Or are you want us 130? No, I think we should order at 130. Okay. Yeah. Order at 130, see if it comes out at 135. Between 135 and 137, I think it's probably going to be like optimal. But let's go around the room. Uh, David, do you think that's fair? Um, yeah, that's, that's fair. I, I'm still frustrated that you know, outside of maybe Doug, I probably spent the most money or close to the same amount of money on my meal, and my steaks were the ones you that think? were worst off. I should have gone to <laughs> Sizzlers. <laughs> Steve and, is, and got the grill marks on it like Bonanza. Yes, right. Steve, is that uh, is that a fair temperature to go to? 130 degrees. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a I'm a 130 degree guy. I, I can live with that. Well, how do you? I just uh, how, how would you do I, your you know, steaks at home? What like, kind of flashlight? What kind of flashlight do we take, Doug? Yeah, Doug. I mean, <laughs> a flashlight. Okay. Oh, I've got a uh, one that goes like fifty yards. That's what oh. I'm taking. You got a four. You got a four D cell mag light that doubles as a, a <laughs> pistol whip. Well, yeah, I, you know, it's for hunting. It's do, for do hunting. We have I, to take I got a flashlight. You can. I got a flashlight. You can see from space. But <laughs> you know what? What are we going to do? We have with to take into consideration that's going to continue to cook the meat when we put that type of <laughs> yeah, well, flashlight. It could have some meat. Whatever. So what? What well, kind? They'll be, they'll be talking to Beefo Brady. It I can't think. be fluorescent light. Is that what it was, Steve? Yeah. Right. No, it right. can't be a fluorescent. All right. Flashlight. So we don't want to take a fluorescent flashlight. So LED is probably going to be all right. And yeah, mine's uh, LED. Yeah. So you know, pocket flashlight, thermopen pocket. You know, maybe get some exterior holsters. I mean, Doug, you'll fit right in down with the other Texans down there, except you're packing a put thermopen. Your, put your and, uh, pocket protector in, too, Doug. <laughs> hey, yeah, right. I have one. Yeah, it's a concealed handgun uh, you know, carry one. down here. Hey, so I got one got of those, too. We got those in Ohio. Hey, so uh, let me come clean. I do not have a review. Shame on me. We eat. I know. Totally. Uh, my, my edict, and I did not follow my own orders. However, I do have big plans to add to head to one of the most consistently top-rated, independently-owned steakhouses across the country. And believe it or not, we have two of them right here in Cleveland. That's Red the Steakhouse. 
And I will be getting whatever the well, I'm not going to get that tomahawk one that they have because I it's just too much money. But I believe they have like a 55 day age uh, dry aged oh. ribeye. So I will get that, and we'll see how well I do next month. So if everybody wants to go with flashlight and thermopen, we can do it one more time. And we can probably dispel the mist. I think aside from David, uh, everybody else was kind of right on point. I, I mean, if we absolutely have to go eat another steak next month, <laughs> I, I'll see what I can do. Greg. Okay. Well, I appreciate the concerted effort. Yes. Hey, real, hey, real quick, David, my uh, my contact at the lo- our local Ruth Chris Steakhouse, um, he's one of the uh, people that I use for judges in our competitions down here. And uh, he said that they do not cook with a thermometer here in Chattanooga, they cook solely on uh, feel. And he said the reason they under, he said they also undercook their steaks on purpose here because the steak is supposed to continually cook on the plate mm. as you eat it. Mm. So Instant at 500 feedback, degrees, huh? you could throw on some asparagus, a baked potato, right, right. sear an egg, and have a, have a big wok look. Yeah, you know, I guess that would be a good point if I would have taken – I wasn't thinking that much in advance. I, I, I should have taken a temperature of that steak, you know, halfway done with it and yeah, seen right. if it, it continued to carry over. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'd hit the plate too. I'd, I'd be curious to see how close to 500 degrees a plate was. <laughs> well, it burned hey, David's arm, so it had to be pretty hot. It, it was pretty hot. Uh, guys, let's go ahead and toss around one more topic here while we have uh, about five minutes, so that should get us to the end of the segment. Uh, I was talking with Nick Solaris in the top of the first hour in the first interview segment, and uh, towards the top of that interview, we briefly hit on a topic that I thought would not be a topic ever on the show, uh, which is hot dogs. And last week, I had Stephen Reichlin on. We were talking about hot dogs because he had some delicious-looking hot dogs over at BarbecueBible.com. And uh, we talked a little bit about recipe and how he likes to do them. And after he got done giving me the, not lecture, but uh, the, the really insightful way to do it properly, I made a mistake and said, hey, I like a well-placed, boiled hot dog every once in a while maybe it's because i grew up on it maybe i I, well i don't even know why i mean it to me it tastes good so uh you know a nice soft bun a nice boiled hot dog whether it's hebrew national a bar a ballpark i'm not necessarily a hot dog snob i do like the natural casing hot dogs like five star makes i mean those are pretty good but i'm not a discerning hot dog eater by any stretch and for whatever reason and a lot of ketchup which evidently isn't good according to Nick. So I've, I've been making enemies left and right here. So let's quickly go around the panel first and say boiled hot dogs, yes or no, and why, Steve? Okay, real quick. I've got I've got the thing that you need, fellas. This little uh, thing right here, this tool. I'm, I'm all about presentation. You take that hot dog off of that, and if, can, you see, can you see the diamond cuts right there? Yep. Now, I put this one in the microwave, Greg, Doug, and David, <laughs> just to see you what it would look like, show you. Wow. Now, what Now what division of hell will I be in for putting a hot dog in the microwave with Stephen Wright? Uh, that's the 12th circle of hell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's wow. below the bull people. Jeez. That but, looks uh, like it goes on my BMX bike on the tread tire. Well, I track. think it, it's all about presentation. I want to hear nines all across the board on this one, <laughs> and then of course you put your you put your coleslaw, your relish, and your mustard on it, and it's it's the most delicious food that there is in the world. Period. Uh, so w- you will choose to microwave a hot dog, or you were just showing I, it for show? If purpose? I don't have time to boil it now, you know I've got a job. I'm you know Stephen Reichlin is home, whoa, 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 not whoa, whoa, whoa. doing anything. You said he you can, will boil a hot dog. Su- he, he can sous vide his hot dogs if he wants to. That's fine. But I'll, I'll take a boiled hot dog anytime in a microwave. I think they're uh, great in a microwave. All right. Um, do you prefer a grilled hot dog or no? Uh, no, no. Oh, boiled you don't. Or, okay. Boiled or microwave? Oh, wow. Okay, that might be the fifteenth circle of hell. I got to be honest. Boiled or microwave? David Huff, hot dogs. Yeah, so they're delicious. <laughs> Any way you want to serve them, I do prefer mine grilled. Uh, more specifically, I prefer mine over a campfire while I'm sitting outside my RV and I just put a stick in it and roast it over the old campfire the old-fashioned way. Um, 
I, I microwave my hot dog, to be honest. Actually, my absolute favorite guilty pleasure to eat as far as a hot dog, I will take a slice of American cheese. I will put it on a flour tortilla. I will put the hot dog on and roll it up like a burrito, and I will microwave it, and that is one of my favorite snacks or lunches to eat. Really? Yep. It's delicious. Um, and I will, Doug, if I can... Uh, plug myself for just a second here i am going to be doing a video i'm trying to get into this youtube thing um hashtag huff daddy bbq i'm on instagram facebook.com the same thing i am going to be trying to make i had this idea everybody i see on youtube or that has all these followers they're doing something that's just out of the ordinary i'm going to be taking a hot dog and chopping it up almost like steve's little grill thing that mm. did there in little chunks and mixing it with a hamburger patty and trying to make, if you can't decide if you want a hamburger or a hot dog, I'm going to be trying to make one in the same. I don't know what I'm calling it yet, but it will be a hamburger and a hot dog combined. I think it's going to be called a ham dog. Ham dog, exactly. Come on, what are talking about? So I will post the video of that here probably after this weekend. I'm going to try and grill it out this weekend and see how it goes. Uh, Steve, was that contraption you had called the slot dog? Uh, it is called the slot dog. All yes, right. It is. Very good. Uh, dog. Doug, we'll end with you. Hot dogs. I didn't realize that I am a bar, uh, a hot dog. Well, I'm a barbecue snob, but I'm also a hot dog sm- snob. Big surprise. I have not <laughs> allowed a hot dog on any of my Traeger grills. And no, certainly if I won't grill them, I definitely won't eat a boiled hot dog. It tastes like nothing. So you need all the contents <laughs> to have it. The only, only time to have a hot dog is maybe if you're at a baseball game, you can have a hot dog. And that would be the only reason or situation I could picture having a hot dog. Wait, Down wait. here. Let me, let yes. me, let's recap very quickly. I just want to make sure I'm understanding yes. this. You are saying you don't like hot dogs, period. Period. Whoa! Revelation they upon don't. revelations going on here. They have... No taste. They have no taste. You have you to have be to kidding have... me, Doug. Hot dog. Traeger, remove no. this man from power immediately. <laughs> now, now, sausage is a different deal. Sausage is king down here. So, I mean, sure. we have what's called kolaches, or yep, yep, um, yep, yep, uh, yep. actually, it's you know, uh, the real name is uh, klobasanek which means pig in the blanket. It's Czechoslovakian for pig in the blanket. So that's a, like a jalapeno sausage with cheese in a yeast kind of a dough bun, mm. and you have to bite into it to really kind of see what it is. Kalachi <laughs> has jam or cheese or something like that. So we have that. Jam. I will eat that. So the pig in the blanket, I'm in because it has jalapeno sausage, not a hot dog. So no Hebrew national, no Nathan's Famous, no ballpark. Nothing like that from a from a hot dog standpoint. Like, did you have a bad experience as a Ute or something like that? The, they don't taste like anything. It's mystery meat. It does is it doesn't taste like anything. I mean, you At can't sit a- here, Doug, and tell me honestly that the hot dog doesn't taste like anything. It has it a taste to it. Taste it's like it's anything. meat for crying out loud. It has to have a no. taste. No, no. Well, that's why you have to to uh, it, put onions. Ketchup, brown mustard. No, did you, know, did and you all hear? Of that on there, so. Did you hear Nick yeah. Solaris go on and on about how the Sabret hot dog is full of garlic? Okay, okay, well, it's a garlic hot dog. It's not a regular <laughs> hot dog. The only person allowed to say a hot dog doesn't taste like anything is Joey Chestnut. Right. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> all right. Great transition here, David Huff. Uh, inside of ten minutes, how many hot dogs? and buns can you cram down your mouth oh my goodness am i allowed to throw up afterwards or not but you you can't throw <laughs> um, up during time but you can do whatever you want after the fact big big dude love hot dogs i'm gonna go high and say nine nine wow look at you like that all right steve how many hot Three. dogs inside of 10 minutes three three come on you can but, do I, could do, than but I could do 23 fillet sliders <laughs> all right uh, doug, uh wait doug does zero all right look thank you thank you <clears throat> let me now let me ask you because it is pointed out by uh, john dawson in boise idaho that a hot dog okay. by definition is indeed a sausage nevertheless 
Nevertheless, if you had to cram down hot dogs in 10 minutes, how many do you think you could do? I don't think I could do nine. I could probably do five, six, seven, maybe. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That. Yeah, I'm in the six category. I think uh, the first three could be done inside of uh, a minute, and then it would be rough to get the other three down. As I was telling Stephen last week, the first one tastes the best. Like, it's magical. And then the second one is not as magical. <laughs> and then you eat that third one to try and recapture the first, and then you hate yourself after that. It is the no, law no, of diminishing no return. No hot dog magic. No. no. No hot dog. Luckily, my friend this weekend did not ask me to cook his kids' hot dogs on my Traeger Grill. Would you have told weekend. him no? He, yes, I would have told him no. Are you kidding he me? He hates kids. He hates kids. Oh, my kids. God. <laughs> Doug, what are we talking about? You won't put no. a, you wouldn't put a hot dog on your grill? It's a principal thing, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is the best embedded correspondence like when I've ever Doug hates kids and hot dogs. That's like hand in hand, I think. Wow. Well, that, yeah, what, a, yeah. what a meat snob. Holy wow. Cow. I love it. This is great. All right. Uh so anyway, uh, next month uh, I will hit Red the Steakhouse. Maybe I'll even go twice to make up for the fact that I didn't go last month. Uh, or maybe I'll try one of those Morton places and then do red. Everybody else will hit one more steakhouse. We'll bring non-fluorescent lights. We'll bring thermometers, and we'll do it one more time, and then maybe we can go ahead and dispel the uh, purposeful undercooking meat myth that I floated out there a couple weeks ago. In any event, <laughs> uh, in Tennessee, you have Steve Ray. In Texas, you have Doug Scheiding. And on Thank the road you. in Oklahoma, you have David Huff. They are the embedded correspondents. Thank you, guys, as always. There they are. Absolutely spectacular. I am completely All guests appear via the Traeger Grills hotline. That mm, Doug mm, Shining mm, is yummy. 100% anti. Won't even put a hot dog. If, if, his, if his friend's kids asked for hot dogs, he would have told them to go... Pound soap. Unbelievable. Hold on. Well, now, hold on a second. I've gotten way ahead of myself. Let's go ahead here. There we go. Very interesting to end the embedded correspondence. No doubt. Jason King is the same. No hot dogs. Oh, wait. He was being the hot dog Nazi, I think. <clears throat> Folks, let me talk to you quickly about the Barbecue Guru before we have to get out of here. We always believe outdoor cooking should be easy and fun because it can be, especially with the Monolith Barbecue Guru Edition Grill. The Monolith, the first world's temperature-controlled smoker with built-in power draft fan. This means smarter control and greater freedom with automatic temperature control. Easily choose your cooking time and temperature and let the Monolith do the work of a sous chef or a barbecue pitmaster. With minimal effort, you now have oven-like precision at the grill and you can serve the tastiest juiciest meals each and every time call them 800-288-GURU or visit the website bbqguru.com we're back to wrap the show right after this stick around we'll be right back whole packers full racks legs and thighs injecting butts if you've never heard this before you might think you found the best triple x show ever Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. All right, welcome back. Let's go ahead and make tracks out of here all the way back in the first hour. We had first-timer to the show, Nick Solaris, and you can find him at nicksolaris.com. You can also find him on Instagram under the same handle. Tweeter underscore between first and last name. Looking forward to having him on again sooner than later. Also, Mike McLeod in the second interview portion of the first hour talking about the World Food Championship's potential new final table face. We'll see how that shapes out here in the next couple weeks and have him back on to finalize it and announce. And then the embedded correspondence segment took place in the second hour. Big show planned for you next week, as always. September 11, 2001. I will never forget. Until then, this is your program host and proud U.S. American Greg Rempe first saying, Start the game! Let's go! And also saying, Good night now.